Hello, I'm Graham Norton. In 2016, Radio 2 broadcast a special series of four programmes about the music of Neil Tennant and Chris Lowe, a.k.a. Pet Shop Boys. Next Sunday at this time, Francis Barber looks back on the pets' work for stage and screen, including their musical Closer to Heaven, their ballet, The Most Incredible Thing, and their operatic work about codebreaker Alan Turing, A Man from the Future. Then Miranda Sawyer talks in depth to Neil and Chris about their albums Electric and Super. But back to this programme, and it's another chance to enjoy the story of their early years at Parlophone Records. In March 1986, Neil Tennant and Chris Lowe released their debut album, Please. As Pet Shop Boys, they would go on to sell more than 50 million records, including 40 top 20 singles and four UK number ones. And throughout that time, they've continued to walk a tightrope between pop and art, silliness and profundity. Hello, I'm Graham Norton, and welcome to a special programme charting the early work of the most successful British music duo of all time. Featuring an exclusive interview with Neil and Chris, we'll be revisiting their inventive and influential albums released on the iconic British label Parlophone. This is their story in their words. This is Pet Shop Boys documentary, The Parlophone Years. I think what drew us together when we first met was music. And that's what we first talked about. I mean, when we met, that was a pivotal time in music because sort of underground electronic music had just become pop music. Dare by the Human League, Soft Cell has just appeared, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, and Chris, to my horror, um, <laughs> light imagination. Still do. Uh, and, and actually, he was right to that one. And I was just being, I, I always remember a bit of a new wave snob. And also I had a, I'd bought a synthesizer and didn't really know what to do with it. So that was what really brought us together. Where the pet shop boys Where the pet shop boys Neil was working anyway. I was a student in architecture in Liverpool. And when we were first going to make a record, Eric Watson, who was a friend of mine from Newcastle and he did a lot of photography for Smash Hits. And this is when we went to New York to record with Bobby Orlando. And when we came back, he heard the songs we'd done. I think actually he was slightly astonished by them. And he was doing something with Epic and he played the tape of these three songs to Gordon Charlton, who was an a and man at Epic Records. And this was 1984. I close my eyes and see you better than before. Then I feel you touch me and it's 1984 I know what you will say Before you start In my heart And with him we did basically a one-off single still. This was the original version, West End Girls. And we just thought, wouldn't it be great to have a single on 12-inch available in this dance music shop on Berk Street Market? And we finally got that, you know, so that was really our only goal at, at that point. I've said it all before, I'll say it all again. We're all modern men. We've got no future, we've got no past. Here today, built to last in every city and every nation, from Lake Geneva to the Finland Station. Our western town, a dead end world. Eastern boys and Western girls. Oh, Western town, a dead end world. Eastern boys, Western girls. Western girls. We were very ambitious. <laughs> but Epic dropped us, they didn't sign the next single. And I remember saying to Chris that, that this year I have a manager, and I thought that Tom Watkins was a big character with a persuasive manner. And Tom Watkins had a band on the label EMI. We signed with them. One of the reasons we signed with them was because we thought he could get us a deal with EMI, which indeed he did. But we didn't want to be on the EMI label. They noticed that EMI and Parlophone. We wanted to be on Parlophone. Firstly, because my smash hits journalistic background, I thought that EMI was a slightly naff label. And whereas I thought Parlophone had the cool history of particularly, of course, the Beatles. Oh, no, I was aware of the Beatles and the Parlophone logo and the pound sign and everything. Um, in those days, I used to look at 
the singles, the Seven Inch Singles label quite a lot, and I was the sort of parlophone pie, and um, the few others, and they sort of had a sort of certain they held, held sort of magic for you. So parlophone was definitely one of those. And so when we signed to EMI, and we insisted that we went on parlophone. So this was in 1985, and, and I left Smash Hits, and Chris had finished his degree and, and come down to London. It was a standard record company deal in those days, which was for seven albums. And I remember us thinking, like we'll ever make seven albums. When we first started writing songs together in 1981, 82, I remember Chris saying to me, can't you make the words a bit more sexy? And we used to kind of wander around the streets of Soho and I sort of saw what he meant rather than write poetic singer-songwriter stroke new wave lyrics, which is kind of what I wrote before I met Chris. So we wrote a lot of songs, and so when we signed to Parlophone, we actually had enough songs really for two, if not three albums. And on the first album, Please, we decided it was like a journey. On the first song, Two People Run Away. Two divided by zero, zero, two divided by zero, zero, zero. Let's not go home, we'll catch the late train. I've got enough money to pay on the way. When the postman calls, he'll deliver the letter. I've explained everything. The lyrics of Two Divided by Zero were inspired by me and a, and a girl I knew used to go and look at Newcastle Central Station at night and think about getting the train to London running away. And, and then you arrive in the West End with West End girls and then you fall in love and love comes quickly and then you make money and then tonight is forever and then there's violence and finally the two people decide they've had enough of the party and the pleasure and they're going to live together and sort of settle down so it's meant to be an emotional journey. Mm, if only it ended there, we'd all be happy. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't. <laughs> Featuring some of the songs they'd worked on in New York with producer Bobby Orlando, the Pet Shop Boys' debut album, Please, was released in March 1986. It included a new version of West End Girls, and that single went on to win a Brit and an Ivor Novello Award. But who would produce Please? Tom Watkins knew Stockhagen and Waterman. I remember him talking about them, but we wanted Stephen Haig. I can't remember any suggestion of Stock Aikman Waterman. We definitely went with Stephen Haig as the producer of Please because we liked what he'd done with Malcolm McLaren on what was the specific record? Madam Butterfly. Madam Butterfly. We made West End Girls for Stephen Haig as a sort of experiment. And having made it, we said he should definitely do the album. Tom wasn't that keen. I don't even know if part of them were really, but 
I think they were surprised how tasteful it was, but we insisted that Stephen Haig did it, and, and so he did. into making everything feel special. The first single was number one. The third single didn't even get in the top ten. And so we're, we're thinking we need to really do something with Suburbia, which everyone thought should be a single. Suburbia, that's a remake, isn't it? Yeah. Because we maybe we felt that we could um, take it further sonically or something. Or maybe we didn't feel that we'd spent enough time on it on the album version. And so we remade it with a producer called Julian Mendelssohn. And we decided that it would be like an EP, and we would do, on the packaging, we'd do one track each. My track was called Jack the Lad, and Chris's track was Paninaro, which has been a bit of a Petra Boys classic. And we, so we remade the track, and also we did a 12-inch version. And Eric Watson took the photographs and indeed made the video. And one of the photographs is a famous picture of Chris with the stripy glasses and the stripy T-shirt that he bought in Japan. And when we, I remember... So it wasn't the video with David Alden? But the dead woman styled it, but Eric made it. No. Well, just, just yes, get no. the facts right. I've, yes. I've remembered the facts, everyone. Let's get it out there. Yes, no. <laughs> the high street Where the dogs run Roaming suburban boys Mother's got a hairdo To be done She says they're too old for toys Stood by the bus stop With a felt pen In the suburban A police car to break the suburban spell And another reason why there's a lot of mixes of things is because in those days, record companies used to release different formats to drive a record up the charts. Cynical marketing. But you used to use that demand to do new things. It's on the front page of the papers, this is the hour of need. Where's a policeman when you need one to blame the colour TV? We were all, always been prolific songwriters, and so we always liked the fact that you had an excuse to put new things out. Well, a song I would choose off the album Please would be Violence. We bought a PPG, which is um, a synthesizer, and has some really great sounds in it. That was used extensively on this track.
In September 1987, following the success of their debut album, Please, which made the UK and American top tens, the Pet Shop Boys released their second. The UK triple platinum album, Actually. With this album, we wanted variety. We wanted a bigger sound than the first album. We wanted it to be more dancey. I mean, by this point, this is we're making this in early 1987, house music has arrived on the scene. You've had Daryl Pandy, Folly Jack Master Funk, and when we're hearing this music in clubs, and so the first track on the album, One More Chance, has the piano, and there's definitely a, a sort of house feeling coming into what we do. Someone's been talking, and I've got the blame. Chained, framed, you know what I mean Push me in the corner and I'll scream Just give me one more, one more chance We do have quite a few songs to fall back on One more, one more chance We've already written a lot of these songs before the first album. So One More Chance, the opening track, is a co-write with Bobby Orlando. And it originally to track Bobby Orlando, the backing track was written for Divine. One more, one more chance, give me one more, one more chance, give me one more. Something we always wanted to do right from the start, though, was to bring in real sounds and putting it under the music so it sounds filmic. So, for instance, it's a sin which starts with an entirely irrelevant quote from NASA of a rocket taking off. Two minutes, 20 seconds, that thing it sounds like the start of a film. And that's why we have that. It sounds like you're moving through landscapes. To emphasize your Catholicism, we go with Julie Mendelssohn to Brompton Origin Westminster Cathedral and record the ambience of them. We put them in the middle section of the song. You hear the ambience of Brompton Origin. It just gives this, again, rather filmic sound like you're moving through landscapes. Father, forgive me. I try not to do it. Turned over. The way we were working back then, we were kind of remaking demos, so we wanted someone who could polish kind of what we'd done and make a lot better what we'd done in our demos. We're also increasingly interested by what you can do in a studio and exploring that with Intimate to create a bigger, more atmospheric production. In those days, well, you used to work in a, in a, proper, a proper studio, Psalm West. It was slightly more... It's a bit more experimental. You could mess around a bit. For um, weeks on end. You know. you know, and faff was the word we used to use. We could faff a lot. I mean, our rent actually was different. Rent actually was quite a few different metamorphoses. Because originally it was fast, wasn't it? Rent it was, was punk. A, rent, was rent was a fast song. Yeah. It was almost high energy. And yeah. um, we realised we had too many of those. So um, Andy Richards half speeded it. And that was, that was good. You dress me up. what the sound of contemporary pop in 1987 to 1988 was because the dance music influence was very, very strong, but we had this strange production thing that was sort of like no one else, and it seemed, just seemed to work at the time. 
came out of luck in all of this as well, you know. But we, I think we had good songs, and we had the confidence to, to follow our own instincts. From the album, actually, I'm going to choose the final track, which is called King's Cross, which I still think is one of the best songs we've ever written. This is in the period of Thatcherism, and this album was received when it came out by rock critics as a statement about Thatcherism, which was quite interesting. It didn't occur to us while we were making it. But when you, when you looked at it, rent, shopping, about money, the money culture, it couldn't happen here, it's about the AIDS crisis which had uh, arrived. And, and King's Cross was, though, meant to be a sort of a symbol, a hymn to the people who were getting left out by Thatcherism. Only last night I found myself I got the second album, I also had to bring in a dance producer and we approached this American dance producer called Shep Pettibone, who for many years people thought was an anagram of Petro Boys. We learned with him a sort of different way of looking at the making of a record in terms of what it would sound like on a dance floor. And dance would be central to the Pet Shop Boys' third studio album. Released in October 1988 on CD, cassette, remember them, and a limited edition 12-inch vinyl set. It was called Introspective. The concept for Introspective was just six 12-inch mixes, and if we were going to release them as a single, we'd then edit them down. But the starting point would be to make long versions of the songs. Because we were making records here for the, for the dance floor, not, not for radio. Also, looking at this, we were really into the big, big label on the vinyl. That's probably the main reason for doing it. <laughs> Knowing us, I Want a Dog was very exciting because we worked with Frankie Knuckles for the first time, which was amazing. We were in New York and we went to, where was the studio? Jersey City. Jersey, and um, he played us what he'd been working on. It was just fantastic, so much bass and everything. So that was a really, that was a real highlight of making this record. I want a dog to walk in the park. was our most successful album in terms of sales. And we've met Trevor Horn in some of my studios, which he owned, in fact, and he's agreed to work with us. We were always obsessed by Trevor Horn's record, Slave to the Rhythm, which he made with Grace Jones, of course, which is still one of my favorite records. And we'd written this song called Left to My Own Devices. And Trevor had this amazing idea that we would record it in one day and we would record it live. Anyway, it was, we thought, great idea. Well, of course, it famously took six months to make. We were really enthralled by these sort of long dance arrangements you could do. It's not a crime when you look the way you do, the way I like to picture you when I get home. It's later tonight, I pour a drink and watch the fight Turn off the TV, look at a book, pick up the phone, fix some food Maybe I'll sit up all night and day, waiting for the minute I hear you say Try and I could and left to my own. 
Throughout our career, we have been interested and enjoyed listening to Latin pop music. The first guy we ever worked with said, oh, I like the Latin rhythms. And we didn't even know what he meant. And what he meant was ding, 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 which has always been a sort of instinctive virtual voice thing. if you could make an album where every single track was a hit single. Uh, with Julian, we, we, we redid Also Our Mind with, to make this extremely long version in my house, because of course we're doing house music. You are always on my mind. You are always in my house. We've made the hit single with Patsy Kent at Faith Wonder. I'm not scared. We decided to do our own version. And actually, five out of these six tracks were hits. Admittedly, one of them not by us, I'm not scared. And we went to Miami and did this record with all these Cuban musicians, which stomp became Domino Dancing. So we, we sort of achieved that. What Tom Watkins has to do is persuade EMI that this is what they call a contract album, because it's only got six tracks on. But as we said at the time, station to station, but they've both only got six tracks on it. <laughs> and they accepted it. The American record business in those days, I mean, there are books written about it. There's a famous book called Hit Men, about record promotion, where money changed hands, and, and I don't know that we were playing the game right. For a period of three years, we had a stream of hits in America. Number, uh, West Ham Girls was number one. All They Don't Deserve This was number two or something. What Was On My Mind was a huge hit. It's a scene was top ten hit. And we were all over MTV, which is the big thing in those days. Dormo Dancing was the last one. People have said to us since that the video for Domino Dancing was sort of homoerotic and that put MTV off. To be fair to MTV, they did play it though. <laughs> I don't, so I don't know, it's always been a mystery. Maybe they just had enough of us, but there was, the moment was there and then it wasn't there. I don't know why, I don't know how Thought I loved you but I'm not sure now Seen you look at strangers too many times The love you want is of a different kind But you know what, that's pop music. It's fair enough. And we started off in America as a cult band, and we went back to being a cult band. In 91, we toured America, and we've toured America every two ever since. And we still have quite a following there. It's right. Well, a song I would choose, It's All Right. I've not heard it for ages. This is far closer to the original Sterling Void song. This brings back happy memories of going to house music events around London.
the follow-up to Introspective, which would go on to sell over 4.5 million copies worldwide, the Pet Shop Boys stepped off the dance floor and looked to their analogue past and one of their earliest compositions, a song called Jealousy. This is like 1982 or something, and Chris comes back from the weekend in Blackpool and he hands me, in a slightly self-conscious way, a cassette of this piece of music written on the piano. I didn't use to like playing too much on the piano because I felt that if I'd done it and I hadn't recorded it, it was gone, it was lost. The great thing that happened over our lifetime has been the use of computers and sequences and everything, so whatever you do is remembered. Because in the old days, of course, you'd have to write with manuscripts or whatever. I can't believe that I actually went to the trouble of <laughs> recording me playing the piano onto a cassette, but I obviously did. So back then, I must have um, thought it was worth recording, which I'm quite surprised about. So, so I, what, did I to play it to you or something? And it sounded, it's not actually a million miles on the record, really, and it sounded like Edith Piaf could sing it, which is what, that's what I thought. It sounded very dramatic. And I always think it sounds like it could be in French. You know, but it sort of sounded like it did after me. And so I tried to think of the sort of words that someone like Edith Piaf might have sung. It was going to be on the first album, it was going to be on the second album. And finally, we recorded it for this album. Looking at where music's at in 1990, which is very dancey, which we like, it's very sample driven. Everyone's using the funky drummer loop on their records, inspired by the Stone Roses using them. Um, so we decide to go in a slightly different direction, to go back to analog, old fashioned synthesizers. How can you expect to be? have an idea of making a record that's not really dancey, that's more autumnal, that's more sort of moody, that almost follows on from King's, this track King's Cross. It's more a bit like that, because there is that side to us. And I don't know how we hit upon him, but we ask the producer Harold Faltermeyer from Munich, and we meet him and we like him. He's got all these fantastic old art synthesizers, you know, with wires that you plug in here and there. And, uh, we go to Munich in 1990 and make this record. And there was nothing going on in Munich. <laughs> and Germany hadn't discovered the rave revolution at this point. If it, if it had, I couldn't find it. And I did try looking. So it was just basically the, the beer hall. This must be I 
actually well, it wasn't all bad though. I mean, because um, how old Fault am I? He had a little um, little hut in his garden with, a, with his own beer tap and everything. He used to make his own sausages. A bit worrying, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think anyone that's got their own sausage making machine in the garden is a bit worrying. He's the only person we've ever met who had their own abattoir. Released in October 1990, the album Behaviour featured the UK top five single, So Hard. No, I wouldn't have had So Hard on this album, because I think it um, spoils the mood of the piece. When we first started to appear on top of the pops, everyone's having a party and there's streamers and spandau ballet looking really glamorous and it, and so the Bet Shop Boys were not doing that and this was regarded as being boring, I've said it myself. But I thought the phrase being boring, I was struck by how musical it was and the little ing, ings on the end of the words and it was, so it was in my notebook. And I seem to remember in terms of the music, we also had, which is, is probably not what people would think would be inspiration, um, Stock Aiken and Waterman had become dominant in pop music and were sort of universally reviled by your kind of rock league types. Chris and I, as songwriters, people making records, were incredibly impressed by how they could churn out hit songs with strong ideas one after another in, in actually surprisingly varied styles. And, uh, and we were particularly obsessed by Better the Devil You Know by Kylie. And what they used to do is they used to suddenly go up a semitone into the chorus and we thought, oh, that's good. So on this, this is the first song where we did that. So being boring, it goes up a semitone from the verse mm -hmm. into the chorus. Yeah. We should do that again. Yeah. When you're young, you find inspiration. lyric were in the centre of the AIDS crisis at this point and my best friend from Newcastle had moved to London, he'd become a teacher, um, was diagnosed with AIDS when suburbia came out. So throughout the, the sort of imperial phase of the Patrick Boys, this very good friend of mine had AIDS and it was in 1989 he died. And so I wrote the lyric as a sort of memorial to him that we're, we're in Newcastle and then we moved to London, and then the final line, the final verse rather, is, is now. Now I sit with different faces in rented rooms and foreign places. All the people I was kissing, some are here and some are missing in my 1990s. I never dreamt that I would. This is sort of an autumnal sounding album behaviour. So I'm going to choose track five, which is called Only the Wind, which is a very, I think, a very beautiful song. It's an unusual lyric because it's kind of about a relationship between a man and a woman. And the man has hit the woman. 
and he's feeling remorse and guilt. It's only the wind, how it takes you by surprise, suddenly begins, then before you know it dies. My hands are not shaking, I don't touch a drum. You must be mistaken, I know when to stop. When life is calm, I have no doubt. No angry drama. Storm blows itself out. Storm blows itself out. Having made the decision to make a slightly melancholic autumnal album behavior it had to our horror only sold two and a half million copies and we were feeling a bit down the dumper as we used to say and would still say and also there is a tendency throughout our career to react against the previous thing and so having done a beautiful statement we decided we want to write something very very up dance poppy in a sort of modern pop idiom and that's what we did after a recording break of two years or so the pet shop boys returned in september 1993 with a new album called very and its bright and sunny sound came housed in a distinctive orange plastic cd case that reminded some of lego we decided that the CD case was boring and we could make this CD case the actual object. And the designer for this said tactile for the 90s. I mean, it's definitely tactile. Good packaging, though. It must have cost us a fortune. Did we, did we lose money on every copy sold? <laughs> no, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Triumph of packaging over content. <laughs> no, no, actually, that was a joke. That was a joke, everyone. Ask me album is very a bit of a statement isn't it of intent that and it's the only album in the uk that we've got to number one it was number one for one week that is that's the that's the amount of time we've spent the, in the, on the number one slot in the uk album charts one week <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that Go West, which was quite an obscure Village People song, but it had that um, classical chord change of Packer Bell's Canon, which I thought would lend itself to a house interpretation. But also I thought that the lyrics, which back then, which were talking about a better way of life, and the context of the 90s, would take on a, a completely different meaning. And particularly when with Neil singing it, it would bring out a melancholy in the song. And so I thought you'd get that juxtaposition between uplifting dance and then melancholy of um, something that everyone was aiming for, this better, better world and better way of life that, was, that had been taken away. I think if I said this album is better than you think, um, I mean, God, who, who needs rock critics when you've got me in the band? Um, 
Um, we should have plastered that on the cover. Uh, I think <laughs> what I would have meant by that was it's super, two styles. It's superficially a shiny pop album, but in fact, underneath that shiny exterior is quite a lot of depth and, as ever with Bad Boys, angst. I mean, you've got astonishing songs like Dreaming of the Queen, which is a very unusual song, really. I put two anxiety dreams together. Someone having the classic anxiety dream that the Queen comes around for tea, and also you go outside and you're as you're naked, which are apparently two classic anxiety dreams. Dreaming of the Queen Visiting for tea You and her and I And Lady Di When I thought of that, I thought, ooh, that's a good idea for a song. The Queen said, I'm a ghost A very strong lyrical idea. Love never seems to last almost writes itself in. However hard you try And die replied That there are no more lovers left alive No one has survived So there are no more lovers left alive And that's why So the track I would choose for further listening from Very would be Young Offender. It's very electronic sounding. I like the lyrics, Neil, on this one. Thank you. <laughs> You've done very well on that one. And we actually performed this live in one of our shows and we had a great friend of ours, Paul Tuchel, made this film and we just um, looped some of the footage from that and I was um, particularly enjoyed. Well, this one was strong. I really enjoyed performing this. It's, also, it's quite ravey, it's quite acidy, yeah. acid house and all of that it's stuff. It's also samples computer games. Well, we're, using, we're using sort of computer game mm. sounds in the background. Yeah. At the end of the very era, we suddenly decided to do a tour where we went to South America and Australia and also Japan and Singapore. Thing. And we didn't come to Britain, I don't know why. It was amazing to me that our commercial peak, which we had with Ferry, we didn't tour, but we just, but we did tour in Australia, Latin America and the Far East. Um, anyway, we, we did this tour of Latin America and we heard a lot of Latin American music and we had this musical idea what would it be like if you took Latin American rhythms and put them with the sort of donk, 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 donk of synthesizers and also we'd been to they used to have a Stonewall concert every year the Equality show it was called for the charity the activist group Stonewall and we saw these Glaswegian drummers called Shibum, it was a troop of female drummers banging sand drums and we were kind of mildly obsessed by that as well. In fact, they're on several of the tracks on this. So we decided to make an album that makes Latin music with our kind of electronic music. It even has the main single, Servida Rey, is a, is a Portuguese phrase and that's the kind of linking thing that goes through the album. Come outside and see a brand new in your mind We'll blow our way It's easy to believe Then get to stay But you 
against ourselves. You know, all of our album titles had one word. We thought for the first time we might call this album Pitch Up Boys, That's The Way Life Is. Which is quite a nice title, it sounds a bit fatalistic. But for their sixth studio album, the Pitch Up Boys settled on the title Bilingual, released in September 1996. I always thought maybe the album was too long, just just stuck a little bit more to the Latin theme. But I mean, I think it's got some, some very strong songs on it. I mean, it might be post-rationalising it, but this album is made at the height of Britpop in 1995. I don't know if we actually sat down and said, let's do an album that's the antithesis of Britpop. I think we thought, let's do an album that mixes Latin rhythms with European electronic music and see what it sounds like. And then you think, oh, as it happens, it's actually the antithesis of Britpop. Um, it's called bilingual. So it's sort of going against the grain of what's happening in British pop music. Quite a loved up album this because mm. the song, it always comes as a surprise, is the most romantic ballad the Petra Boys mm. have ever recorded by, by quite a long chalk actually. Mm. I think it's a really beautiful production and I, love, I like the song. I think it's um, the Petra Boys are sort of famous for being ironic or a bit camp or something. Actually, so many of our records are really heartfelt. And this is a very heartfelt statement of how I felt about someone at the time. I can't be cool. I would say it's about this one. It's not as bad as you think, is it? <laughs> what was my quote? It wasn't. <laughs> it's better than you oh, think. Oh, that's right, okay. <laughs> it's better than you think. <laughs> it's not as bad as you think, this one. A lot of hope in the track before, which is my favourite track on this album. You found your love before, is it? How's it going? It comes knocking at your door. It comes knocking at your door. There you go, you see, there's a bit of hope there, which I like. A scintilla of hope.
Welcome back to Pet Shop Boys documentary, The Parlophone Years. It was probably quite good fun at the beginning. Actually, it wasn't like it is now. It was, you know, you, you, there weren't loads of, sort of paparazzi hanging out that I remember. And there weren't lots of uh, gossip magazines and all of that, and there was no internet, so it didn't really seem to affect you too much, really. You could just carry on as normal and then just pop off to do Top of the Pops or something. I wasn't really that aware or that bothered about fame back then. It was something that we'd never really desired. We didn't do it to be famous or anything. We're the Pet Shop Boys We're the Pet Shop Boys I mean, we used to do a lot of promotion. We spent, really, the first three years of our career making records and doing promotion, making videos, that's what we did. We would go to Germany and do Peter's Pop Show, and then you'd have to do a photo session with Pop Rocky, a pop magazine, or one of those magazines. They normally wanted you to jump up as well, didn't they? Yeah. Or, because with the Pet Shop Boys, be with teddy bears and things like that. Mm. And actually, it was there was always a lot of rows going on because we were very... We had, on our record sleeves, this very minimal presentation, and we were very concerned about the design and the presentation of everything. And then you sort of go abroad and you're expected to do these sort of kitsch things that we didn't like. So the, the issues were never about fame, they were about presentation. Integrity. Yeah, in integrity. We've yeah. always wanted to maintain our integrity. <laughs> then we posted pictures with the competition winners and argued about the hotel rooms and where to go for dinner. And someone said it's fabulous, you're still around today. You both made such a little go a very long way. Yesterday. As the 1990s came to an end, so did the Pet Shop Boys' spell of commercial infallibility, their imperial phase. With six studio albums behind them, they now faced a future where they no longer had to chase hits. Instead, Neil Tennant and Chris Lowe ventured into the nightlife. We decided in about 1997 that we were going to write a stage musical. And actually, we were going to adapt Brighton Rock by Graham Greene, the stage musical. And we approached Stephen Daldry, who's, you know, become a film director since, but in those days he was, he ran the Royal Court Theatre, and he did a production at the National Theatre of an Inspector Calls that we really liked, which is a famous, very famous production. And we met him, and we started, and then we couldn't get the rights to Brighton Rock. And so we decided to work with the playwright Jonathan Harvey, who'd had his big success with the play Beautiful Thing, and we started sort of slightly haphazardly writing a musical, which actually, Jonathan Harvey came up with the title, Nightlife. We liked this title so much, and we said, no, let's call the album Nightlife, we'll call the musical Close mm. to Heaven. And um, the sort of concept of the album was things that happened at night. Is this something to do with how perceptions are different at night? That's oh, correct, isn't about it? That. That's a go. Yeah, imagine good. that, everyone. Well, yeah. I've heard it enough times. And it sort of follows that through, hence a song like You Only Tell Me You Love Me When You're Drunk, because maybe they're, they're intoxicated or something like that. What a performance tonight Should I react or turn off the light Looks like
Well, this is the era of the long song titles. We have You Only Tell Me You Love Me When You're Drunk. I don't know what you want, but I can't give it anymore. I mean, you could have called that drunk, you could have called the other one, I don't know what you want. But we like the long song title. That's what the title is. Why should you edit it down? It was, again, sort of going against the grain. Even now it seems like a kind of pet shop boys thing to do, doesn't it? big idea for this really though was electronics with an orchestra and we approached the musician and composer Craig Armstrong who'd worked a lot with Massive Attack uh, and had his own solo album The Space Between Us which is a beautiful album. We also worked with David Morales, the DJ and we worked with, with Rollo because we love very much liked his early to mid 90s dance records. Um, it was interesting as a side to this, when we were working with him in the studio, he said, Oh, uh, I've just got to, sit, got, got to go and say hello to my sister. I'm helping her make an album. He didn't make a big deal out of it. And we all said hello to this young woman sitting outside in the studio reception. Of course, it was Dido <laughs> who was making an album that was about to sell 15 million copies. Well, that album was about to sell about a million copies. Mm. But this was quite interesting album to make because we went to New York, with, worked with David Morales, and for some reason, Chris was in New York before I was, and he and David Morales started working on New York City Boy, so they had a track when I arrived at the studio. Mm. And because it was in New York City, I thought the title New York City Boy. <laughs> A friend of mine who used to work at Smash Hits had moved to New York to work for an American magazine and he'd been telling me about how his kids used to love, they lived in a suburb and they used to like to go into like, Times Square and hang around with all the electrical shops and all the rest of it. And people have often said New York City Boy is incredibly gay, actually it's about a totally innocent kid going into New York from the suburbs and just hanging and looking at all the electrical shops thinking how exciting it was. This was a this was a great photo shoot actually because we were meant to go to Coney Island um, on the on the New York on, on the New York subway, but we kept getting on the wrong train, um, so we never actually got there. But the great thing about New York is that even though we were dressed like this with big uh, black eyebrows and makeup and or oh, fright thanks. wigs and everything, not one person on the subway showed any interest at all in what was going on. They'd seen it all before, but it's a shame because I've always wanted to go to Coney Island and we never made it. I love these orange wigs, it's a bit Bowie-esque, isn't it? Mm. Um, I love the blurred faces, that gets around any retouching. We've gone a bit weird, haven't we? I mean, <laughs> we've finally lost the plot here. Seventh Avenue meets Broadway. There's some very beautiful songs in this album. I think there comes a period in in what we do where, where we, we write quite a lot of beautiful and moody songs. A particular favourite track for mine off Nightlife is happiness is an option. I like the idea that you can choose to be happy or choose to be sad. But there's a really great musical bit in that I really like um, where Neil sings It Isn't Easy and uh, it just gets me every time that which I think is really, I think it's very strong, very strong. We produced it. The one track we produced is actually based on vocalies by Rachmaninoff. A piece of music I've always liked when I used to have classical singing lessons in the early 80s. I said to my singing teacher, can't we do vocalies by Ramanov? Because it's it has no words, it's just R's. And I finally sang it on the record. It is not easy.
For their first studio album of the new millennium, the Pet Shop Boys did what they'd always done, something very different. This is the album release from 2002, when we um, decided we were going to reinvent the Pet Shop Boys. We're a band. We've come back as a band. We've come back as a band. And we've, we, we've sort of made this ourselves, really. Yeah. Um, just got someone in to mix it. And I bought a house in County Durham. We had a little studio in there. And I also had two electric guitars. And Chris, who doesn't normally like guitars, encouraged me to play the guitar along with the tracks. And so we make a sort of surprisingly guitar-y album. And then we asked Johnny Marr to come up. And Johnny Marr on this album plays on almost every track. And then we record percussion, live percussion. The excellent percussion is called Jody Linscott plays on it. Um, we've gone back, it's really like, a bit like behaviour, it's a bit autumnal. Um, it's a sort of broken-hearted album. This album really is better than you think. I think it's a really excellent selection of songs. One of the funny things about being the Pet Shop Boys is people have a very strong idea of what the Pet Shop Boys is. And when you're not that, some people, assuming they care, find it a bit frustrating or a bit puzzling. And so the first single of this album, which is a really beautiful song, I think, Home and Dry, just doesn't sound, it starts with what sounds like a guitar arpeggio, but it's a bit like Every Breath You Take. Actually, it's a Chris Penn synthesizer. It's full of vocal harmonies, quite unusually for us. we'd have been thinking about what we'd have been doing after it. It's what we wanted to do then and I mean I think some of it had to do with with its location as well. Neil's place was you know quite remote I think that's reflected in the music. It's quite northern isn't it? It's, it's quite bleak. I'm mean, not that your house is, is bleak in any way. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Neil lives in a very bleak house. It's called Bleak House it's actually. Called, it's actually called Bleak Good title house. for a book. We came from the far north Summer in Crimea Deserted the armed forces Had to disappear Made it to the free west On a chartered flight So we could see what We trained to fight we were in London Let's do it Let's break the law We were in London Tell it like it is We were in London Tell it like it is Sometimes when we do like a ballad that I sing in a high voice, Tell it like it is. we say, oh, yeah, it's a Kermit song. Can we just imagine Kermit on the Muppets sitting, you know, <laughs> green puppet singing it. And Chris remarked somewhere, Oh God, you sound like Julie Andrews. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the perfect diction, isn't it? It's the, it's the, the fact that you can hear the words very clearly. It can sound a bit prim and proper sometimes, can't it? A captain with seven <laughs> children. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, for some long-time Pet Shop Boys fans, their eighth album, Release, 
which came out in April 2002, was no laughing matter. We did set out to reinvent the idea of the Patrick Boys, and I think whether you like the reinvention is a different matter, but we achieved what we set out to do. Feeling like I'm stuck in a This album was originally called Home, and our friend, the photographer and artist Wolfgang Tillmans, who we'd got to know just before this, who did the controversial video for Home and Dry of Mice in Tottenham Court Road Tube Station, he said, oh, what's the album called? And we said, it's called Home. Well, he, didn't, he made it quite clear, he thought that was a terrible title. And, and he knew his Pet Shop Boys, and he said, you, we should just call it something like, can't you just call it something like, I don't know, Release, because it's a release. And we said, great title. And so, Release it became. No, and what Wolfgang, I think, was thinking of was it was a sort of a pun. But it's also it, an emotional release. It's an emotional isn't it? release and a record release. I mean, love is a catastrophe. Cool. Yeah. When you write a song that is your innermost thoughts, almost unedited, apart from putting them into it to fit a meter, it's sort of embarrassing when people hear them. You have to sort of disguise. I prefer to disguise. If we'll sing it through an assumed character or something. On this album, there is no assumed characters at all. And love is a catastrophe. You know, I was feeling very down about something. And um, there it all is. Love is a catastrophe. Look what it's done to me. this over the top of that and I've always thought it's beautiful it's more arpeggios there's a lot of arpeggios on this a lot of arpeggios I think we've done arpeggios now yeah I we think we did them very conclusively on this yeah. it's a very 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 bleak song when we did the tour with this album we started to tour with Nightlife we started to tour a lot but this album really started to tour a lot and we had a band with two guitarists and percussionists and ourselves Chris Blank keyboards and I played the guitar as well and that was a very interesting thing because we traditionally toured with dancers and all the rest of it and we went out as a band, and actually it went down quite well, funnily enough. I was with Bernard Sumner from New Order saying, we thought it was our best show. I don't think he ever liked the wigs in nightlife. <laughs> and we really learned, I learned personally, learned a lot as a sort of performer. Because I remember the first night of the tour thinking, 
oh my god there's like, there's like no one else is going to start singing so it was a real really strong learning experience but Love is a Catastrophe was actually the sort of centrepiece of the show it worked very very well live Love is a Catastrophe I think I have a mild obsession as to people's behaviour and whether people do things out of sort of unrestrained desire and instinct or whether it comes a point where you decide to fall in love, for instance, which is what this is about. It's the last song on the album. It's called You Choose. And this is a very philosophical lyric. You don't fall in love by chance, you choose. Do you, whether you slip off the cliff or jump off it. And it was also, I think, the first time we did what we call an Elton John Bernie Taupin, where I tied up the lyric and I handed it to Chris and he says to music. I was thinking sounds about the Velvet Underground. Lick your wounds by your boots. You won't get drunk by accident, you'll choose. Don't blame him for refusing your bid. He didn't decide to love. to the Pet Shop Boys' ninth studio album, produced by Trevor Horn in 2006, a political concept was fundamental to the project. We decided after release with all guitars, we were going to make a very electronic sounding album. We also had an agenda for this album, which is broadly speaking a political agenda. We were going to make an album about the post 9-11 world, about this surveillance culture that had entered our lives, which has only ever grown since. And so we had a, actually had a sort of an agenda for this album, which we wrote down on a piece of paper before we even started making the album. And so the album starts with the song Psychological, which is about fear. Who's that knocking on the cellar door? It's psychological. And it ends with the song Integral, which is sung from the point of view of an authoritarian government. If you've done nothing wrong, you've got nothing to fear. If you've something to hide, you shouldn't even be here. So it is, in fact, the cl really the closest thing we have to a concept album. After having basically produced the last album, we probably thought we wanted a really great producer for the next one. And also, it's, it's really great being in the studio with Trevor Horn. I mean, I mean, he's a fantastic producer, but also he's very entertaining. I like seeing the way he works. You don't really learn a lot, because like, you never quite know what's been going on, do you? Sort of magic does happen at some point, but... Normally at two in the morning after we've I think after we've, got, <laughs> we've yeah. gone out for dinner and he carries on doing something. You definitely get something special with Trevor. If 
I would call this pop with depth. Depthy pop. It's got <laughs> musical depth. Actually, we returned to Bombast with this. We hadn't done Bombast since the last time we worked with Trevor. The Sodom and Gomorrah show, very bombastic. All through the album, we thought this is the first single. It's the kind of, it's a scene of this album. Sun, sex, sin, divine intervention, death and destruction. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Sodom and Gomorrah show. It's a long track, but it was very difficult to cut it down to like four minutes, three minutes, 50 because when you did that, you'd somehow lost something. And what we, what we noticed was by this time, compared with the 80s, radio is more conservative. In 1987, no one even mentioned to us that it's a scene, it's five minutes long. No one said, oh, of course, you're gonna have to do a radio edit. And on this, we knew we would have to, we knew there was no way you could go to the radio with a five minute song anymore. Sometimes you can write a song and the impact of the song is in the length. I lived a quiet life, a stranger to champagne. I never dared to venture out to cities of the plain. I heard about the way of life, took it with a pinch of salt. I think people had a problem with the title as well. In that they thought it was about sodomy or something. Mm. The title actually comes from the Bible. <laughs> and so really, I'd just taken the biblical story and sort of updated it. The Sodom and Gomorrah show in the song is meant to be about the media overreacting to everything, about celebrity culture, which has long been a sort of subject of ours. Whether within that extreme culture, love is possible. It's also quite experimental. This is a song I made my excuses and left. It started off because we I think we've been to see the History Boys or something um, at the South Bank, and I decided to walk home. And I was and it was raining, and I was feeling really miserable. And I remember I kept singing, "I'm all I'm all alone again. I'm all alone." <laughs> and so I sang it into my phone as I was crossing over Waterloo Bridge. But then it sort of developed more and then I wrote the lyrics and it became about John Lennon meeting Yoko and how that then affected... Um, Cynthia. Cynthia. Uh, so it's actually, it's story... So it tells a really great story. Because um, Cynthia Lennon wrote a word of autobiography and she described how she went on holiday with some friends to Greece and they came, she came back to the house in Surrey and sitting on the sofa was John and Yoko and she realised it was over. 
I walked into the room Imagine my surprise You were sitting close to him Staring in each other's eyes Each of you looked up But no one said a word I felt I should apologize For what I hadn't heard A silence filled the room as an elephant In the crowded courts of your love I was now a supplicant And clumsy as I felt At stumbling on this theft To save further embarrassment I made my excuses And left But then it has a happy coda because when she realises it's not the end of her life and her life will go on she will meet other people and have other happiness and so it sort of has a happy end And of course, it's a very Petro Boys thing because it's really about English embarrassment as well. I, I'd had the idea of writing a song for a while called "I Made My Excuses and Left" because it's a sort of sort of thing journalists mm. write. And uh, I'm, uh, also, there aren't many songs with the word "supplicant" in, are there? There aren't. You don't get that with everyone. You don't get that with Coldplay. Actually, you probably, probably do. do. You probably Coldplay. do actually because the bra brainy pop stars. Brainy pop stars. Yeah. We have always reacted against the previous album. The previous album was a very beautifully crafted, big sounding concept album with a political agenda. We decided the next album would be up pop music. And this is the period where girls allowed are churning out classic singles like Biology, produced by Xenomania. We suddenly thought this would be a marriage made in heaven, Petrol Boys and Xenomania. We go down to the little town outside London where Xenomania was based and meet Brian Higgins, very charismatic, interesting character, completely obsessed by hit records. So, of course, I feel an affinity with him immediately. And he reveals us afterwards he had no intention of making an album with us. He just thought it'd be quite nice to meet us. But we come up with the meeting he's making the album. Is this a riot? Are you just pleased to see me here? Why aren't we holding hands and talking sweets? So it was, it was a very different way of working, very different way of working. So we suddenly enter the world of the modern songwriting team, where you have a bit of a backing track, and you sing words... This is where we first core. came across the word lyricking. One of Girls Aloud said, oh, I'm really looking forward to lyricking. 
And Chris said, oh, we call that writing lyrics. <laughs> and, um, and actually, it was, it was exciting being yeah. in the studio and Cheryl Coles, as she was, Cole as she was, I'm sitting in the sort of reception. And it was very, and it, it re-energised us with pop music and this discipline of leaving your ego at the door and writing a song with other people was quite inspiring, actually. gets USB sticks with mixes of all sorts of things going on and plays them and then sort of directs the whole thing and then you know, there are teams of people in various rooms around the, around the house doing various bits and pieces and various rooms in, a, in an old house and the house had something to do with... It's where the real Alice in Wonderland had lived. Alice Little. Yeah, so one of the, one of the studios was her bedroom. Completely different to how Trevor works. With Trevor you're in a studio and... You're all as a team, but this is fragmented working. I was sent off to do something over there, and you and know, Chris was given a load of backing tracks, animated yeah. backing tracks, and told to write melodies, top over lines, them. and things. So it was a hive of activity. It was um, fun. It, it was, was really it was great. Really good fun. And the single "Love Etc." was a track they had lying around, and Chris heard it and said, "I wouldn't let it lie." No. I kept saying, "Well, that that track you played, <laughs> the <laughs> one with the triplets." Right, yes. And uh, finally we got it and we wrote with Miranda, one of their writers, she and I sang over the top of it. In March 2009, the Pet Shop Boys released their 10th album for Parlophone Records. The Grammy nominated, Yes. Well, I'm going to choose from Yes, one of the songs that we actually wrote with the Xenomania people. And it's a sort of ballad with a story about a relationship breaking up. So I also sound rather French. And it's called The Way It Used To Be.
As the eyes of the world turned to London for the 2012 Olympic Games, the Pet Shop Boys headed for the sun and a project that would ultimately become their final studio album for Parlophone Records. Trevor Horn once suggested to us, really ages and ages ago, that we should make what he called an LA album, by which he meant an album where you go to LA and you get lots of studio musicians who are the top studio musicians in the world and makes very smooth incredibly produced LA album and for some reason this idea had always vaguely appealed to us Kanye West made his very beautiful rather introspective album 808s and Heartbreak and I said why don't we work with the person who did this and we couldn't even get him to return our manager's phone calls <laughs> and then looking down the list of credits on this Kanye album was this guy Andrew Dawson who was the engineer we thought oh well, let's see what else he's done and so we approached him and he was really keen Elysium was released in September 2012 and was described by critics as warm and wise, blending the tranquil beauty of Chris Lowe's synth textures with the realisation that Neil Tennant is on top lyrical form. We went to LA for almost three months. You get a different sound to records where they're made. I mean, records that are made in New York have a very distinctive sound. Records made in there they have a sort of sheen and a polish and they, they just have a different quality. And we wanted to have a record that had that, that LA class to it. Chris wanted this album to be a bit like Behaviour, very reflective, a late night album, a coming back home listening to an album, not a getting up in the morning or, or going out album. It's introspective in terms of its subject matters and moody in terms of the music, but it's Californian moody. Invisible, the second track, which is a very beautiful song, is sort of about growing old. It's also, when I was writing, I was thinking about what it would be like to be a ghost. <laughs> I'm here, but you can't see me. I'm invisible. I'm invisible. I think the first two tracks are two of the best songs you've ever written and produced. Invisible and Leaving. At this point in one's life, my parents just died. And so Leaving is about, sort of inspired by that. Uh, the lyrics are a bit more oblique than that, but it's about that. Every day, oh, every day, in 
darkest night The memory keeps us strong And if our love is dead It won't be dead for long We did the strings at Capitol Studios, you know, in the famous studio where Frank Sinatra used to sing. It's definitely got something of California. That's why we called it Elysium. There's a park in Los Angeles called Elysium Park, is it? Or not an old people song. I don't know. Old people's no, there's some talk. Oh, <laughs> yeah, there <laughs> is. There's some talk on Twitter. Yes. Yes. I think Andrew Dawson did a very lovely job on, on this. When we left Los Angeles, he was still working on it, and we finished it off by sort of email, you know. But we set out to make an L.A. album, and I think we, I think we made one. The track I would like to listen to from Elysium is Hold On. Hold on! Hold on, there's got to be a future. Hold on. Neil had the idea of, well, there's a piece of music you like, was it by Handel or somebody? It was by Handel, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so it took ages programming all the parts. <laughs> and then, I don't think you expected me to do the entire piece, did you? No, I just wanted to take eight bars of this yeah. piece by Handel and sort of loop it. But I programmed and the I went entire out for a run. Piece, and I programmed and the entire piece. <laughs> and also it's one of those songs where you already had you had the lyrics. And Chris then set the lyrics which was to a no, new melody which over Handel's chords. No easy task, let me tell you. And I know the fans don't appreciate the amount of work that went into that because they don't like it, do they? Mm, the people don't like it. No, and that's why they're wrong. That's where they're wrong, sorry. Also in this in this there. period I'd seen that documentary about the wrecking crew. The musicians who played all the 60s records like Mums and Poppers. So on this one track, we bring we have two lots of backing singers. We have the, the Waters, who are family, who sang on the Jackson 5 and all sorts of things, all the way through to Adele. And Andrew Dawson found this jazz vocal harmony group called Sonos. But I, th I really like the lyrics to this one. I just love the, the way it sort of captures lots of the elements of modern life. Traffic jams and, and all barking dogs and, and, barking dogs yeah. and, and all these and other little snippets of modern modern day. Hold on, hold on. There's got to be a future, or the world will end today. Falling from the sky Planes taking off to fly Swooping birds and barking dogs Shopping malls and catalogs Traffic stopped on busy streets Lovers lying between the sheets Business models, computer freaks Modern artists, new techniques Money comes and money goes Children cry and still suppose There's got to be a future I'm not as concerned about chart positions as Neil or Morrissey might be. Um, so it doesn't really bother me that much, really. I mean, it'd be nice if we, you know, top of the charts all the time and everything. It doesn't bring you any happiness, if that matters to anybody. <laughs> it's nice to be successful and it's nice to be loved more than anything, isn't it? And we do get a lot of love from our fans. In dwindling numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that last, <laughs> last phrase. It was going so well up to that point, I was getting quite moved. When we made 
made this album, I thought it was definitely going to be one of the best albums you've ever made. In fact, Polyphone came over for the Grammys. We went to the, the EMI Grammy party and everyone was very excited about it. In Britain, it was a bit disappointing. Germany, top three. Um, well, actually, I do think it's a very strong album. I mean, we're coming off the back of Yes, which did really well. And part of them were very supportive. They liked the idea of who we were working with. In terms of the record company, we're not thinking, we're leaving, here's a farewell album. Because actually, the next album, Electric, which came out on our own label through Cobalt, actually was going to be, for most of the time, was going to be released on by Polyphon. And then we decided to make the break. I mean, when we left Polyphon, it was pretty, I think they were quite surprised, but it was quite a good time to leave, because it's... Actually, after we left Polyphon, Polyphon left EMI. It took us so long We worked so hard We came so far just to compete But don't forget all The love and laughter Now the world is at our feet Looking back at all the times We felt an outcast Didn't think we were going anywhere Just living in the past But in the desperation You get inspiration You've been around, but you don't look too rough And I still quite like some of your early stuff It's bad in a good way, if you know what I mean The sound of those old machines I'm quite happy to look back at the Pet Shop Boys history But it's not something that Chris and I dwell on personally that much. We really prefer to th look at what we're doing now and what we're going to be doing. Isn't it always with a sense of shame? With a sense of shame, of course. Remember those days, the early 90s We both applied for places at the same university Ended up in London where we needed to be To follow our obsession with the music scene Wherever we went Thanks to Neil Tennant and Chris Lowe.